Good morning. This is November 19th in the year 2002. We're in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is John Coates, and we're very happy to have with us today John Caprillian. John, good morning. Good morning. John, for the record, would you spell your name for us? First name or last name? The last name is K-A-P-R-I-E-L-I-A-N. And the first name? <laughs> well, I use go by A. John. A. John stands for Armanag, and I use the word John. Very good. May I ask you when you were <clears throat> born? I was born in June of 1919, the 20th. And your current address? Natick. In Natick, and marital status? Still married. Good for you. Do you have children, John? Yes, I have two. Mark Caprian and Gail Caprian. Those are nice names. How about uh, grandchildren? I'm sorry, I don't have any. <laughs> okay. Yet. John, when and where did you enter the military? Well, I was working uh, in a garage one day and uh, Pearl Harbor started. Seven days after Pearl Harbor, I volunteered which was December 14th, 1941. You volunteered to go into the armed forces and did you have, you had then a choice to go into any one you wanted to? Yes, I have a choice. I picked the, uh, the Air Force because I wanted to get into flying, which I never made. But unfortunately they put me into a mechanical school on trucks and that's another story in itself. Okay, let's take it a step at a time. Where did you sign up? In Boston? In Boston, at the recruiting office. And you went in and said, I want to join the Air Force, and they, they took you? That's and correct. I went in and said, I want to join the Air Force, and they signed me up. And from that point on, five days later, I was gone. When you went into the service, um, were you all alone, or did other guys that you knew in school go with you? No, I went in all alone. You were by yourself. I had made that decision that that's what I was going to do. And uh, how soon before you were actually called up into active duty? Well, after I signed up, they told me that in five or six days they would call me, and at which time I was to report, and we were shipped off to Fort Devens. It was five days. Five days later. So five days later. You were still in 1941. And you're in the armed forces, and you're. Did you, did you go to Fort Devens uh, for basic or for kind of uh, indoctrination? We went to Fort Devens for basic uh, indoctrination, and they gave us our uniform, our clothing, and I don't recall how long we were there. Maybe about two weeks. I came home once and went back again. At that time, we were told we were leaving on the next weekend, and we got on a train and went to Mississippi. Had you ever been away from home, John, or was this your... Uh... I have never been away from home, and I had not been anywhere. But the adventure in me took over and I was going to go. So just about Christmas time, they put you on a train and sent you down to Mississippi. Um, where in Mississippi were you, do you recall? Well, that, you bring back a memory, I was supposed to report to the uh, motor Vehicle Division of the Army, where I was going to be a mechanic on trucks. But on the way down, we wound up at a camp after four hours on a train. No, no, I'm sorry, not four hours. It was a good long ride, all I can remember. And nobody got any sleep. So we pulled off the, off the train, went into a barracks, and we took a test. Well, nobody could uh, do the test right because we hadn't slept for, for the whole trip down. So after the test, we went to the barracks and settled down. And a little roughhouse started, a little roughhousing. And I wound up with a fractured ankle at Camp Shelby Medical Hospital. Welcome to the Army. <laughs> Welcome to the Army. I didn't even get a chance to get the names of the people I went down with. Six weeks in the hospital with a cast on my foot 
commanding officer caught me running down the corridor, told me I was gone. When I went back to, uh, I forget where I went back to, that same base, I demanded to see the CO. I learned a lot in six weeks in the hospital. I wanted to take my test over again. And this time I, I passed with 110 IQ, which qualified me for the Air Force. Very next week I was enrolled in technical classes in the Air Force Academy in Mississippi, where I took my, uh, took lessons in aircraft construction, aircraft electrician, aircraft uh, instruments, and we went through the whole phase of basic training on aircraft, how to put it together and take it apart. Looking back at it, John, from you know, your perspective of uh, having, having done a full life of, of doing other things, uh, how would you characterize the, the caliber of the training you got? Was it good, excellent, wonderful? They really uh, threw the stuff at you and you picked it up very good. We were young and we picked it up very well. And we all learned a lot. It was really intense training. But right after that school, we got shipped out to uh, New York. You said earlier that you had joined the Air Force or was it the Air Corps in those days? It, there was no Air Corps. It was an Army Air Corps. Army Air Corps uh, that you had joined so that you could fly. When, what did you think now you, when you see yourself in all this training? You, it's beginning to dawn on you that you're not going to fly. Once you got in there, I found out I was in the Army. And then I got into the Army Air Corps. And they just moved you around wherever they needed you. They weren't listening to what you said. So by pushing, I took the test over, qualified for the Air Force uh, schooling. When I finished that in about 10 or 12 weeks or more, like I said, we got shipped out to uh, Long Island, New York, to be a technician on a P-47 fighter plane. Three of my friends came along with me. I wound up as an electrician. Teddy uh, McCullough wound up as a propeller specialist, and Ali Williams wound up as an instrument specialist. We all finished that school, graduated with uh, certificates, and then we were sent out to individual bases. All three of us came to uh, Bradley Airfield in, uh, in Massachusetts. Okay. If I understand what you said, they took a whole airplane and divided it into different parts, specialists. Yes. So one guy gets the propellers to work on the props, and you became an electrician, and you even specialized in P-47s. Yes. Would you describe a P-47 for us? The P-47 is a very heavy plane with uh, eight 50 millimeter caliber machine guns, very heavily armed. When they fired those machines, it would tear up anything in its path. It's the heaviest armament that's been on any plane up till then. So were there, what did you have to do on the plane? Well, the plane itself, I was supposed to make sure the generators worked, the instruments were running properly, and the lights, all, all electrical wiring was in proper order, and uh, all the components of the electrical end of an aircraft I was concerned with, right down to the ignition. And were, were you working on real planes or dummy mock-ups? Oh, these are real planes. Okay. When we got to uh, <clears throat> Bradley Field, we were working on P-47s there, and they had women specialists in there too, working on those planes, civilians, and we integrated with them, and they showed us the ropes on how to handle all the uh, problems that a P-47 might have. Was this thought of in the Air Force as being a, a hot plane? It was supposed to be the hottest plane, the newest thing on the market. What was it used for? It was, I believe it was used mainly for strafing. When you come down, you could tear up a railroad yards or any building. It would, it would really devastate it. Mm -hmm. Very powerful plane. It still is. It had a big engine in it, and it was very heavy. 
This is early 1942, you're out on Long Island. How long did you stay there? Well, from Long Island, when we finished the school, as I said, we went to Bradley Field in uh, Massachusetts here, and we were assigned to our squadrons. I came out of the, both schools and we walked into a building and says, you are now in the 328th Fighter Squadron, 352nd Fighter Group. Me, Teddy McCullough, and Ali Williams, we walked in. We were the only three people in that building. We got our blankets, got our bed. Next day, over 100 people showed up that went to other technical schools to support the rest of the squadron. Uh, full complement of people arrived within five, five days. We were all there. On a particular plane, you were part of a ground crew. I think that's the terminology. Yes. How many guys were responsible for a plane? How many of you were assigned to a particular plane or were you assigned just to what, whatever plane worked assigned, on that day? I was assigned to all, I believe it's 24 planes we had. I'm not sure the number. But I was assigned to every plane. I was responsible for the electrical circuits, the generating circuits, any phase of that electrical department that came under my jurisdiction. Just it, you? Just me. The only electrician for 24 planes? Me and two assistants. Okay. I had two assistants. The uh, setup was one man department, two assistants, the propeller department the same way, and the instrument department. There were three, six, nine of us that constituted the technical end. Besides the mechanics, they had their own crew. We had specific mechanics that did various parts of the operation. Then we had armament people. Ordnance men. Ordnance men. Yeah. We did nothing but uh, guns on the planes. And uh, we were assigned planes at the, at the base. And I forget what the time was, but uh, I came home three times to visit. And each time we came home, they raised us in rank to, pay, to commensurate with the pay we would be getting. By the time I left the States, we got on a boat to England, I was a technical sergeant. This is still 19... <coughs> excuse me, this is 1942. It's the later part of 42. Okay, where did you sail from, John? We got on a train, we all wound up. We had no idea where we are going. We wound up, I wound up in the Queen Elizabeth with thousands of people on there. Where did you sail from? Where, pardon? Where did you sail from? Wherever Queen Mary sailed from, I had no idea. I believe it was New York. We got on a, on a train, we got shipped out there, got on the thing. Next thing you know, we're out at sea. And there were soldiers sleeping on the deck, under the deck, all over the place. It was packed. And uh, the bunk I was assigned to was supposed to be on day shift for me, and then I'd go on night shift. We split the bunk between two other people. But uh, I have a habit of being very nosy. So that first day out after I got knocked on my heels by an ex-boxer who was my technical sergeant on the crew. He says, that's my bed. Okay, it's your bed. So I got up and I wandered. And I went down to the bottom of the ship, all the way down to the engine room, through the catwalk, and I walked into a room where were five Australians and about 50 beds empty. Needless to say, that's what my outfit loved up. <laughs> they John, were reserving we're, we're, it for the Australians, who, the English, who may, they may have to be on the plane, but that room was empty, and we took it over. John, so we was, had hot you, water and food that was good. Were you part of a convoy, or was the, the ship was so fast it sailed over by itself? I have no idea. We could have been in a convoy at that time. I couldn't tell. Where did you land? I have no idea, but we landed in England. We got off the, off the boat. We got onto a train, 
and we went choo 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 in these little box cars, which are so strange to us. English trains are different from American trains. And after a day of traveling, oh, we stopped on the way for a break. We got out. Anybody want coffee? Yeah. English coffee is tea with milk in it. And that was a surprise to us because we all learned the hard way. Well, I've been drinking tea ever since, really. And, and I assume you eventually wound up on a base? We wound up on a base, uh, a little town called Bodney. And we wound up on the base with assigned barracks. And we all piled in, took our respective rooms, and we had no idea where we were until the next day. It was all under cover of darkness. And uh, I always was under the impression that we're the only outfit there. But I have something here that will say that it's different. Why if, don't you show us? Do you have a, a book uh, there, John? No, I have this little, uh, oh. it's, it's called, it's a little map of England. And when I got there, by the time I left, I found out that this covers every military plane in England, from bombers to mosquito bombers to phot photographic planes to fighter planes of all kinds, is based in England, and their bases are marked right on there. And I'm in the middle somewhere. Thank you, John. It depicts every air base in England. Then I found out that I wasn't the only outfit there. <laughs> Would you describe the, the base, the size of it, John, and where it was in relation to, say, a town or the wash or where you were? Bodney was, uh, was a small town in itself. During the war, with all the bombing that was going on, we were the only airfield that was not bombed because we flew out of cow pastures. It was a cow pasture, it was hilly, and we were in a, no, no runways, nothing. We took off the grass. And we were only there about three months when we were converted to P-51s. They took all the P-47s away from us, sent us to technical schools to brush up on the frame structure and the way it runs. And we were given P-51s, the fastest plane at that time. Were the only Americans on this base or were there British planes too? There was all Americans only. And there's no British planes. It was assigned to us as a cow pasture. And as I say, it was a rolling landscape and the planes took off on a, on a rolling landscape. And we were there for quite a while. To this day, apparently it was a private property of some type because there was a gatekeeper and there was an English couple that had a little girl there at the time. And our um, security used to visit them and make sure the neighbors were fine. Today, that little girl is in charge of the memorabilia on that field. That field is still there. Has it, have you gone back, John? I have gone back. I've gone back to my old barracks. <clears throat> we have a stone there with all our names on it that we were there. It's a large commemorative store. I don't have the picture with me, but I do have a picture of it. And my barracks is now uh, is now the, uh, the mess hall. It is used, as of last year, for training all ground forces in England. They go in there, they tear up the ground, make their bunkers, and then after they leave, another crew comes in, put the bushes back in, replants it, brings it back to the same level that it was. It is a training ground for ground forces today, for the English. John, let's talk about the plane involved, P-51. This was a, an extremely significant airplane in, in the American effort because when they put wing tanks on it, it was able to escort the bombers, say, all the way to Berlin and back. Were, were, were they fully operational that way when 
you first got them or the wing tanks added later on? What phase now did you get? Now that's another story. We were converted to P-51s and uh, they took all the P-47s away and we flew that for about three or four months. And our bombers were going into Berlin. After they le reached a certain point, there were no fighter planes to protect them. They were, like they say, deadbeat on the wing, and they were getting knocked out of the skies. Christmas. One Christmas, we spent all night putting tanks on the wings. We worked all day and all night, we put in these fuel tanks on the wings. So the next day it was operational. And each plane had two tanks that would hold gasoline. And they would fly all the way in with the bombers, eject the tanks, and make it back home. And that's what changed the tenor of the war, the way they were flying. It really helped the bombers out. Can you put a date on that, John? Could I you... can't put a date on it. I don't remember. Okay. Well, but I believe it's in my. It's listed in my book. I have a book that our outfit put out. Yeah. That I've donated to the library. It describes the history of our outfit, what we've done, where we've been, and what we've accomplished. Th that's a very historic event, the putting the tanks on the planes. Um, can you describe a typical day that you went through on this base? What did you do as an electrician on an operating base during wartime? I made sure that all our aircraft were in running condition. We had one incident where the aircraft pilot refused to fly it. I had to go in there and check it out. You get in the plane, you run it up, you bring it to full power, you block the wheels, and make sure the uh, generator kicks in at the proper time and all electrical systems are working properly. After checking that, the instrument, instrument man goes in and he checks the whole system out. And we when we say it's okay, it was okay to fly. We have never lost a plane for malfunctioning equipment in our outfit. Every plane that flew always came back unless it was shot down. And we lost quite a few planes at the time. We had one plane that uh, came down in uh, Scotland. First time I'd ever been up in a plane. The commanding officer says, you are going out to check that plane. The pilot claims it generator ain't working. I went out with a spare uh, a generator and we flew a little two-piper, two-seat plane, me and the ins inspecting, the man who was inspecting, and the pilot, three of us. First time I've been in a plane. I so almost, you, got, you finally got to fly. I yeah. finally got to fly. <laughs> Boy, was that uh, the experience. After an hour and a half in the plane, we were way up in Scotland. We came down, I went to the plane, I put it through its paces, ran it up, checked it out, found that the alternator was malfunctioning. I changed the controls on the thing, put a new one in which I had taken with me, and the pilot flew it back to the base. So we saved the plane. Were there bombers, heavy bombers on your base as well, or did the uh, fighters rendezvous with the bombers somewhere else? There were no bombers on our base. It was okay. just strictly fighter group, and they rendezvoused according to the way it was set up. They would pick them up over the channel and fly them in, and they would come back. We had one pilot go down the channel. When the fighters came back in, you count them and you see that they're all there. Did, you, did the pilots come to you and say, this ain't working right, or this, no, this, this is fine? No, this is quite the system. Each plane had a crew chief, an assistant crew chief. Okay. And a plane would have an armament man, an electrician, uh, instrument man, and a propeller man would cover all the planes. Crew chief would say, we have a problem up here. I'd be on call. Okay. In England, I had picked up a bike. We'd take our bike and run it up to the plane. We'd go up there and do our inspections and check it all out. After every piece of work was done, we had an inspecting officer who would inspect what we've done. It wasn't just completely our say so. He would recheck everything that we've done and he would be responsible for the final clearance of that plane to be run. Do 
You said a moment ago that yours, I think you said that the, yours was the only base that wasn't bombed, um, and you're in southern England. That's right. Is that because you had no runways and they, it, it's not recognizable as a base? Uh, we believe that's true because it was a cow pasture. There were no runways, nothing. All we had was just one tower, a small tower, and that's what we flew out of. But we did get bombed in the end, though. After we went to Belgium to support the Battle of the Bulge. Okay, let, we'll, we'll get there in a yes. minute. In England, did you ever have opportunity to go into the, uh, say, the nearby town or up to London or see any of uh, England itself? We had uh, leave coming and a lot of the boys went to the neighboring towns. I myself went to London over the weekend and I was there when the buzz bomb blew up in the street. And uh, Tell us about that. Uh, you can hear them coming, right? And, you could hear them yeah. coming and uh, people start scattering. I was trying to figure out what was happening so we took shelter and sure enough one buzz bomb landed and blew up quite a section of the road and the building, which I went to investigate later. But there was rubble throughout the streets in England where they had cleaned some of the uh, casualties and some of the damage that was done by the buzz bombs. But I happened to be there at the time when one came in. So I was glad to, glad to get back to my base where they never found us. Yeah. Did you have an opportunity to talk to British people, say families, and uh, discuss the war effort or the fact that uh, they were so heavily rationed uh, that America came into the war three years after they had started? Did well, any discussion that way? I myself did not get into philosophical discussions. I didn't have time. I was there to look the town over, look over at London while I was there. I was only there for a short day or so, and I was going to go back to the base. So I really never started a conversation with anybody, but uh, from where I was staying in England, I could look out the hotel window, uh, what is called the... Uh, oh, those are the uh, sirens I told you we might expect today. <laughs> go ahead. We had people on soapboxes making speeches in Hyde Park. That I saw. You can see it from my window. Oh, with the Marble Arch. The Marble Arch. Yeah. I stayed at the Cumberland Hotel at the time. And when I went back for our reunion, I stayed at the same hotel. <laughs> Did you really? They had a different name, but I was at the same hotel. Because I, re I re remember that Marble Arch, and it was right across the street from it, where the people used to congregate, people used to get up and Talk about the war effort in one way or another. It still goes on. You went through a, at least a winter in England on your base. I did. Tell us about the weather there and how it affected your flying. Well, it didn't affect us that much. We, uh, we managed to make it. It was cold. We used to fly, uh, warm the planes up, get them ready for the pilots. Everything would be in readiness. Uh, the winter didn't affect us that much, but except that it was cold. Raw, pretty raw. Yeah, weather. it was pretty raw. Yeah. It, not as bad as Mississippi. Mississippi, you could wear underwear, long johns, and the cold would cut right through you. It was different than England. It's a different kind of a cold. John, you, um, you told us before this tape started, and I'm going to put you on record here, All right. of the possibility that you danced with what you uh, allege. I wouldn't want to advertise that. <laughs> we'll just leave it alone. Well, I got to finish the thought or else we'll leave a bad impression Well, we used here. to go to these uh, dances that they held in, in, uh, in England. When you were in London, you went to these uh, Red Cross, they call, uh, and everybody was mingling. We talked to a lot of British people at the time. And uh, that's where I learned how to dance. I had rubber sole shoes on, and I learned to dance the English style. I had never could dance before, and I was going to dance one way or another, and I had learned the hard way. But uh, you met some very nice people uh, 
when you're dancing. You ask people you never saw before, and they would graciously accommodate you to get on the floor, even if you couldn't dance well. But they tried to please the American soldiers, make sure they were having a good time at the dance. Are you still a tech sergeant at this time, John? I was a tech sergeant when I retired, yes. Okay. Um, you're in England, and the war is swirling around you here. Did you ever have occasion to hear any of Churchill's speeches, or did you ever hear from Axis Sally over the radio? No, I didn't. I didn't uh, listen to any of that, because we didn't have... If we had radios, we didn't have it in our barracks. So we were too busy taking care of the planes, getting ready for the next, uh, next flight out. We never got around to that. Let me ask you this. When, when you knew there, there was going to be a raid, you, you were gearing up for it, getting your planes ready to rendezvous with the bombers, you didn't know then where, what the target was. We, as ground crew, had no idea yeah. where the planes were going. This was all done in the pilot's, pilot's room. They knew where they were going. Of course, nobody told anybody anything. They can't do that. So uh, all we did was get the planes ready and ready to go. How about this business of sweating out a, a mission that uh, you oh, see yes. them all go, and now you're waiting eight hours, 10 hours, whatever? Yes, when the planes were due back, we would all get out there and wait for them. And as the planes came in and the crew chief took over, if there's any problems, we would go and help. And uh, there was one or two occasions where a guy, one of the pilots never came back. We waited for him, he never showed up. We found out that uh, this gentleman had uh, gone down the channel. And we could tell by the activity on the base that the pilots were very upset. So this one, uh, one pilot went out there looking for him. He spent a good 12 hours looking for him. And on the second trip out, he found him in the channel. Found wreckage? Or? No, he found a man. He's still alive. Really? And uh, the proper authorities were called. He was uh, saved. And uh, I think a month later, he was on our air base with a bicycle that we made for him because his legs will not move. And he was hand pedaling his bike from plane to plane, talking to everybody. And I've had the pleasure of uh, sitting next to him at our reunions. And he just recently died this past year. And he was my age. We're pretty well up there now. But he lived a full life for being down in the channel and being rescued. He, and and uh, as the pilots get together, they talk about it, how they used to go out looking for them. It was a big story now with them. And they kid around it quite a bit. Was there ever an occasion when you guys would get the word that uh, one of your planes was, uh, say, damaged, or it couldn't get its gear down, and you watched uh, watch for him to come in and land? We had two planes that came in like that. It was quite beat up. They were all shot up. I have pictures in my book. We have pictures in this book that I have here. This blue book is uh, our outfit's history, uh, where we repair the planes and pictures of the different planes. And uh, we repaired them, put them back on, and they flew out again. Did you have, have, have to patch them up overnight to get ready for a flight the next morning, something like that? Well, sometimes we'd have to pull them in the hangar. We had spare planes. Well, we worked on that when the pilot was assigned to another plane, he took, took off on that one. But uh, we did lose at least a third of our pilots that went with us never came back. A third of the original assigned pilots. At that point, I said, boy, am I glad I never got to fly. You lost a third of your pilots? Yes. They got on, shot this, down. on this particular base, or you say you were no in in, 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 uh, in combat duty. In combat duty. In combat duty, quite a few got shot down, but uh, we had replacements coming in all the time. It's part of the game. Every air, air base had pilots they were losing. I went to a uh, next town. It was a bomber base where they took uh, photographic pictures, and. Uh, these bombers that came back, 
they're always blood splattered. They got really hit hard. There are more damaged bombers in that base than, than good ones. And uh, it was a sad story, but that's how the war went. These mostly B-17s were just we're talking about? Yes, B-17s. Were there any lighter planes, uh, 25s, 26s? Or, I'm not or familiar the with that. Okay. I don't believe so. But we just had the heavy planes. And as I, as I said, we visited the other play, uh, air bases to see what was going on. I was doing photography at the time, and uh, we were allowed to scrounge any photographic disc we could find, so I still have orange plates and green plates to take pictures with. We had our own dark room set up, and they helped ourselves to it. They let us do it. It was uh, junk, junk planes to start with, so it was available. Somewhere in here uh, was the invasion of Europe and some of the bases that were in England began to move over to the continent. Were you part of that when you said you, you went to Belgium? Well, we heard that uh, there was a big battle going on over there. It was called the Battle of the Bulge, where the German troops were about to overrun our, our uh, forces there. All right, that's, that, that's the winter of 44 then. Yes, yeah. the winter of 44. <clears throat> I was in there. I had taken a leave of absence and gone to England for about four days, to London rather. And while I was there, word came back that, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that I had to get back to the base in a hurry. They were looking for me. So when I got back to the base, I was told to pack up and get ready for tomorrow morning. Next morning, I think it's a DC Havilland, the one with the big bellies on it, the big planes. Uh, the advanced crew of uh, 40, 50 people were packed in, crew chiefs, not the assistants, the crew chiefs, all the technicians, electricians, instruments and propellers, and the maintenance men were all packed in the plane, and we took off the next day, and we landed in, <coughs> landed in Belgium. I forget the name of the town. Uh, it's called Y2. That was right a few miles uh, before the bulge. And we came in there and ready to fly. Our, our planes flew in. We had metal landing strips were laid out for us. We had tents to live in. And we had uh, barracks for makeshift. And now planes took off to help the, the air cover. So coming. this is full winter. You're this there in the winter, winter. Yeah. 44, 45. Right. And you're supporting... Uh, the ground troops. The ground troops. Technically, I don't know what we're supporting. Is this All still P-51s? Is, huh? is this P-51s. Still? All we know is that we have to keep the planes flying. Okay. And one day, uh, we're out there, we checked the planes. Our commanding officer, Colonel Preddy, took off with his flight of planes. And me and my friend Teddy McCullough were walking the runway. Each side of the runway is a metal strip. Each side would uh, line for about 50 yards with 500 pound bombs to ready to be put on a plane so they could take off and do their bombing runs. Well, this one morning it was about 10 o'clock. John, just a second. Um, so we're very clear here. P-51s are carrying bombs? They, had they okay. replaced the uh, fuel tanks with bomb racks. Okay. They were carrying a big, big, uh, big bombs. And uh, we were out there walking amongst the bombs on the track, and I looked up and I saw this plane coming in, like uh, blinkers going on. Blink, blink, blink. I said, Teddy, they're firing at us. And the boats were bouncing off the tarmac. I said, let's get out of here. So he dived into two 50-pound bombs between them for safety, which was safe anyway because you had to hit that on the nose. And that plane came in about five feet off the deck. It was a Messerschmitt 109. And now I know, but at that time I didn't know, that Colonel Pretty was right on his tail. Came up right after him with his guns firing. Unfortunately, 
Our ground crew opened up, didn't get the German plane, but it got our colonel. Knocked our plane out of the sky. That's when we lost our commanding officer to ground lead, to friendly ground fire. The timing was bad. So after that, with all the planes flying, the, the, the tenor of the bulge changed because we were in there helping the ground troops stop the line. So the mission of your planes changed drastically from when you moved uh, from England over to Belgium. That's right. They are now uh, fighter bombers. They're now fighter bombers. And um, your colonel was knocked down by friendly fire. That's right. And you were a witness to this. I believe me and my friend were the last one to see him fly by. And uh, we have a history in, those, those, in Carolina where he started from. It's all in the book. He has a museum where Colonel Preddy is being promoted, and he's one of the war heroes. And we have a list of at least uh, five, six war heroes in our outfit. And uh, we have, I think, five aces in our group. And they were all very good pilots. How long did, did this particular type of work go on, uh, the, uh, using them as bombers? Did they ever revert back to being uh, fighters, escorting no, bombers? No, I believe the war ended about that time. Okay. Just about that time, we got shipped back to England and told to go back to the States. Because uh, oh, while, wait, I, wait, while wait. we were there, the Not war so ended. Fast. This is very important for you. Tell us about where you were, and suddenly the war is over. How did you hear about it? Well, we were on, uh, on that field, at Y2 it's called. We were on that field when we found out that the war was finally over. There's not a little face I'd like to say. While I was there, I had a day off. I was there for quite a while, and I went to visit my uncle in Paris. No passes were allowed, but if you're in the military, you know how it's done. You just do it. So I started out from where we were, and I got out to the crossroads. And uh, I couldn't cross the road. Fifteen minutes, Red Cross trucks. There were Red Cross trucks going without stopping for fifteen minutes from the Battle of the Bulge, carrying the wounded. And so all I saw was trucks, one after the other. I stood there for a good 10-15 minutes watching. All I could see was Red Cross trucks. I don't know where they got all these trucks from, but they were carrying the wounded and taking care of the boys. They did a good job there at that time. They really covered the ground. So that very impressive with me that uh, we went alone. Where, where were you going when this... Uh, I was on my way to Paris. I was going to take a shot, leave of absence, and go to Paris. I left my field and uh, they were taking care of the wounded from the war. And I was just taking a shot, leave of absence to visit my uncle. He was living in Paris at the time. I was, was there for only two days. Was he a, a Frenchman or? He was a Frenchman. Well, he, and he was he su Frenchman. surprised to see you show up? Oh, yes. He was very surprised to see me. I would imagine he was. They were on, uh, on rations, on everything. So I spent a little time with him. He, he had a restaurant in, in Paris, and I visited him at that time. And we had a short talk, and then I had to leave to get back. I take it you got back to the field without any problem? Yes, I got back very well. There's always trucks going in and out, back to the different fields, so you could just hitch a ride and be back there in no time. What does it take to pack up a f an airfield to go home? What, did, no you, what did you have to do? <laughs> I, were, no were you just I didn't have home? to do anything. You were sent home? We were just told to get on the plane and go. You, just, uh, you, get, you, you even got to fly home? Yeah, you even got to fly home. But uh, when I went over, when we were going over there, uh, we had this big supply plane we were on. I was the last man in the door. And when we took off, that was so heavily laden that we cleared the fence at the end of the runway by two feet. I could see the nails on that fence. I don't think we would make it, but just play, just cleared the fence at the field and that's when we flew into Belgium. On the flight home, 
how many uh, of your outfit, were, was everybody removed at once or just the guys who had put in as much time as you had? When we got back to the base, those with seniority were going back on rotation. Were on your point system? On the point system. I had the most points because I was there very early. And uh, to get me back home, they transferred me out, it shows in my record, to an engineering squadron who was also on the base. We had engineers there. And from there, I would be rotated back home. I went over on a Queen, Queen, Queen Lizzie, came back on the Mary. I was supposed to be on the Lizzie. My outfit got home before I did. I was still waiting with this engineering group to get on the next boat going home. Oh, so the plane just took you to England? Uh, back to our base. Okay. Back to I our original it. base. And from there, you wait for we the rotated ship. out. We waited our turn and maintained the planes while we were there and we rotated out. But uh, I got transferred to an engineering squadron, went to another barracks with my duffel bag. And he said, this is where you stay until your turn comes up. I put my bag down. I looked at the bag next to me. I said, uh, why did they let these bums of NATO come in here for? Russ Collins, from the Collins machine shop, was the next bunk next to me. <laughs> so we got to be very good friends. A small world. <laughs> here we are, two people from NATO. Yeah. Coming back at the same time. And we stuck around together, covered ourselves. Oh yeah, we had to do some of the dirty tricks that you hear about. We went out one night, he broke his leg. He hid under the bed. I was out there, roll call, calling his name off. We get by with it. We made it. He didn't have to go to the hospital. If he did, he wouldn't get out for six weeks. <laughs> well, you should know. you, you. You had broken your ankle. Oh, yeah, yeah. We knew how to do that. <laughs> so, so you, you sailed good. home, it and uh, did you sail into New York Harbor? Yes, we did. Uh, unfortunately, it was nighttime. Yeah. I didn't see it at all. We all came into the cover of darkness, was whatever the schedule was, I don't recall. Can you tell us about what, what the date was, John, about when this was? I don't recall. Okay, uh, where, where did you go after you got off the ship? Oh, we, we went back to our uh, base at Bradley, where we first started from. And from there, we were issued uh, papers to go home. And from were, that, were you discharged or? Uh, I was discharged. The honorable discharge, the papers were given, and we took off and came home. But, Two months later, I joined the Air Reserves in Bedford, and I was there for about a year and a half until I finally got out of that because I was going to get married at that time, and uh, it didn't work into my plans. <laughs> so you are discharged, you're out of the service, and then you join the Reserves. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your rank? Tech Sergeant. You're a Tech Sergeant. And what decorations did you have? I really don't know. I know we have two presidential citations. We have a, a couple of clusters. And there were some other presentations because of our effort during the bulge, which I never got. I have written to the VA to get the full complement of my medals that I'm supposed to be getting. And I haven't heard from them since. But uh, I didn't bother looking for medals. I just packed up and came home. Okay, but that in that shooting incident you were not wounded that No, day. I was not wounded. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. And you joined the reserves. Did you join any veterans organizations? Uh, are you a member of any now? I'm a life member of the Veterans of Foreign Wars in Natick here. When you came home, um, what was your feeling about having served in the military? Did you discuss this? with your family and tell them about some of the experiences that you've shared with us? Well, we talked about it, but nothing in particular. We used to ask me what I did, what, what we did, and where we went. And we had a 
general conversation with it. Nothing outstanding. Can you I didn't get on the soapbox and yell my head off, no. No, but can you tell us today, off the soapbox, how important it was for you to serve in the military? It was very important for us to serve. I believe everybody should spend time in the military to learn something. You learn how the rest of the world is running on what we're doing. You can't tell how things are going from doing nothing. You have to get involved. You have to get involved with the, the society and help each other out. You can't stand back and say it's not for me, because everybody has a part in this. And if everybody does their part, we will get along just fine. In looking back at, at what you did and what you've related to us this morning, was there one memorable experience in, in all your military service the time overseas, the time uh, in combat. One thing that stands out more than anything else. In what respect? Something that you think about more than anything else when your, your service time comes to mind. What pops up first? What pops up first that I was fortunate compared to other veterans that I know to be able to go to school, get what I finally wanted to do, work on aircraft, go to England, help out with the war effort, and come back unscathed. That is the ultimate anybody would want to do. Unfortunately, a lot of veterans can't say that. But I believe I was very fortunate in being able to survive all this and come back in one piece. In more personal terms, John, is there a most memorable character that comes to mind, some person that you remember more than any of the others? No, just that uh, for the last 10 years, I've been going to my military reunions, and we have resumed friendly relations with all the whole outfit. I have pictures here of 200 veterans of my outfit the 328th Fighter Squadron, the 340, 447th Fighter Squadron, and the 448th, which is the 352nd Fighter Group. And we all meet together at our last reunion. We had over 300 people there. That 300 included the engineering of our outfit, the armament people of our outfit, the radio control of our outfit. When an outfit is formed, it has various facets to it from the lowly mechanic to the radio operators to the engineers, the military police, the kitchen help, everybody. In our outfit, we all showed up. We're still getting together on these reunions. And the best part is that I've enjoyed every reunion. I've been to almost every state in the country. We always held it in a different state to be in somebody else's hometown. And uh, we've been to the Air Force Academy out where they trained the pilots. It was very, have very good pictures of that outfit. And our last reunion was held in Carolina with Colonel Preddy as a memoriam, as one of our flying aces. We were, that's where the National Guard is activated and put on active duty, and the squadrons are formed that way. So when we retired, we went back to North Carolina as a 328th Fighter Squadron, and we were received with a red carpet and given all kinds of royal treatment. And thank you for a job well done. I kept asking the people, did somebody put you up to say thank you? He says, no. We as members of the 328th appreciate what somebody has done in our name in the war effort in fighting this war. So we have a record that is undoubtedly one of the best that one could leave as a heritage. That's, that's a very nice memory to have. Is there anything, John, uh, that I haven't asked you here this morning, uh, not in this list of questions, but something that you'd like to add uh, to put on the tape for the sake of history or that you'd like to relate to your family? 
No, I don't, I don't think so. It would get too personal at that point. Okay. But I think that in general, you've covered a good question. Okay, then thanks, I don't John. want to get off and talk about roundabout things. <laughs> thank you very much thanks, for your, for your thank time. Thank you very much.